Let me start. Is the audio okay? All right. I'm pretty impressed by the, you kind of nailed the number of chairs exactly. Like, I know exactly how many people will be here. I know all of them. <laughs> anyway, yeah, let's skip this one. Um, <laughs> hello, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Should, should I play it? Should I play it? Let's play it as a, as, as a way to, uh, to test the sound, just making sure. Yeah, this is called uh, Run Jesus Run, and it's the life of Jesus in 10 seconds. <laughs> Second attempt. It's like a speed run. Perfect speed run. All right, <laughs> all right, so hello everybody. My name is Paolo Pedercini. I'm from Italy, but I live in the United States. I've been in the United States for a couple of years where I teach. Uh, I'm an art professor right now. Um, and you know, like right now we are in an art gallery, but the disclaimer is my work doesn't really start or end in these spaces. I'm, uh, I'm, I think I consider myself closer to that range of artistic and cultural practices that are more intervening in public spaces or media spaces. So uh, kind of like outside, I can try to transcend this uh, white cubes or black cubes. Uh, and uh, specifically, I'm more into the, uh, that network uh, of uh, board office workers, uh, board housewives, and uh, board internet surfers in general that all together kind of form this, this uh, mass medium. Uh, uh, this, all these people together enable the viral diffusion of content on the, uh, of the net, uh, uh, that which as we know at this point in time uh, is kind of becoming more powerful than traditional centralized uh, media. So my goal is to inject some kind of radical memes uh, in this uh, network, in this flow, endless flow of cute kittens and uh, trivial content. Uh, so most of my work is released under a project named Mall Industria, that means uh, soft industry or soft factory. It's a personal project, but I sometimes collaborate. Uh, so Mall Industria essentially deals with the relationship between ideology and electronic entertainment. Uh, so the idea is to combine traditional uh, agitprop art uh, uh, with the deconstructionist approach of culture jamming. So on one hand, it's about using games as form of communications, spreading uh, alternative messages, or using games as a uh, political cartoon. This is a game. Uh, uh, about religion war and the so-called culture clash uh, that employs this sort of fighting uh, game uh, trope, this kind of fighting game uh, uh, layout. So each major religion is represented by a kind of like a monster size, a Godzilla size uh, character destroying a human landscape in the background. And then you can play to figure out which, which religion is the strongest. But on another le level, Mall Industry is about messing with the language of mainstream video games. So it's about kind of like turning, twisting, and uh, changing, and uh, subverting, if you will, um, uh, tropes and mechanics that we take for granted. So this is another fighting game, uh, but it's more like a reverse fighting game. It's called Queer Power. And instead of fighting, uh, you are involved in a kind of like a strange uh, intercourse. Uh, instead of having a, an energy bar, you have a pleasure bar. Instead of uh, taking away the energy from your opponent, you are kind of like giving away energy. Instead of having, uh, uh, you know, like special moves, you have, uh, you can shake, sh sh shape shift, you can change your uh, uh, gender and uh, uh, sexual attributes to uh, recombine uh, uh, freely with your artificial intelligence or a friend. So that's, that's more like what I like to do. Uh, so to me, like the first challenge uh, to make social political commentary with games is to kind of try to go beyond the uh, escapist function of video games. Escapism is, you know, like as to like using games to escape from reality, whatever it is. So uh, the problem is that more often than not, uh, games are wish-fulfilling fantasies, right? They, they are fantasies of empowerment. They put you in the roles of you know, um, heroes uh, and uh, amazing characters and generals or even criminal. And uh, to me, it's, it's a bit of a function of social control. Games, in, to some extent, uh, 
um, kind of like make up for the boredom uh, uh, and uh, the lack of agency in uh, our every, everyday lives. And uh, to me, it's, it's both like a, an issue because, yeah, it's kind of like social control or bread and circuses, uh, as the Romans would say. But it's also, to me, a sign that we are, at least that we are dissatisfied by the current system. And maybe in games we can catch a glimpse of, uh, of utopia, of a place or a space or a society and institutions in which we all have a role. We, are, we feel empowered. We feel like we can make a difference. So, there is that, uh, that aspect. But anyway, I sometimes like to go against this tendency and uh, make games about everyday life. Uh, and instead of forcing players in uh, particularly fashionable roles, uh, particularly cool roles, I, I, I like to force the players into disempowered and even awkward roles. This is an, exa an early example, one of my first games called, it's called e Orgasm Simulator. It's about being a woman and faking an orgasm to please your uh, your partner, which is a dude, macho dude. And uh, it's kind of like a one button game that you have to calibrate your yells, your screens, in order to follow him. Sort of. Pretty awkward. Yeah. And then eventually you fake the orgasm, and, that's, and uh, he feels validated. Anyway, so this is uh, uh, another game that kind of puts you in, uh, in some awkward, awkward place. Uh, this is called Tuboflex. It's kind of a, a autobiographical. It is also about labor or like, like most of games here. Uh, it's about a, a future, a near future in which flexibility and precarity kind of grown to the excess uh, and uh, you are uh, this uh, worker that is being uh, sucked in from a job to another in real time. So there is this company that kind of created this system of tubes al that allows to dislocate and relocate. Uh, uh, let me see if there is that scene that relocate workforce uh, in uh, real time. Um, this is another another game you, you get to play here, so I'm not going to play it too much. Uh, it's called Everyday the Same Dream. It's a more recent one. It's also dealing with labor and alienation, but with a different style, a different sort of face. Uh, and this one, you are uh, kind of a faceless, one-dimensional man trapped in uh, his daily routine. Uh, and uh, you wake up, and you're always sort of late for work, uh, and you're trying to get to, get to work, and you commute, and it's pretty uh, slow and dreadful. And eventually you arrive to your cubicle and uh, you sort of, uh, the game starts over. Like you finally get to the cubicle after a while and the game starts over. And uh, um, if you play a little bit more carefully, you notice that there are some subtle deviations from this daily commute. And uh, when you discover all of them, uh, like instead of, for example, instead of going to work and uh, uh, dressing up, you can show up uh, to your office naked. Uh, and so like less uh, obvious things to do that you, you, you get to discover. Um, thank God I actually don't have, yeah, that's when you get fired because you show up in, in underpants. Um, uh, luck luckily, I don't really have this kind of cubicle job anymore. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a couple of things to introduce the next game about where I live and where I work. This is, this is the institution where I live. It's, uh, this is Pittsburgh, uh, and this is Carnegie Mellon University, and it's kind of like a great job. It's a dream job, but like every job has its own issues. Uh, uh, for example, in a fairly uh, common thing in American academia, uh, especially in technical schools like MIT or CMU, uh, like my institution is a center of excellence in computer science, robotic, and cyber warfare. So uh, a lot of the research founding that comes, this is this, we made that thing. It's, a, it's a, you know, an unmanned tank that's called the Crusher. Um, so uh, some, a lot of our students kind of go to work for the NSA. A lot of research money com comes from there. And it's part of the so-called military industrial complex that, is also, that also includes the academia. So, uh, and uh, now, as we know, as some of you might know, uh, military ent entertainment and uh, military in uh, institutions and uh, entertainment technologies have been evolved together since the real, the very beginning. Like the very first game, uh, Space War, was made uh, at MIT by essentially computer scientists who were paid by uh, defense funds. 
and uh, even like its own like hardware, the, the, the screen that you see there, uh, if you're not familiar with the game, it's kind of like an asteroid uh, spaceship uh, kind of space game. But the, it, even the screen was, uh, uh, was a military piece of hardware. It was like a World War II uh, radar screen. And, uh, and as, as you probably know, games are regularly used as rec for recruitment, uh, recruitment and uh, training, uh, and even to deal now with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is one of the most recent and the last works by Haram Farouki, uh, a German documentary maker, who was kind of documenting this relationship and showing uh, how uh, games are being used uh, to train uh, and uh, to uh, deal with the stress and trauma of war. So, and uh, I think this co-evolution is also reflected on the, uh, I would say on the culture and uh, on the discourse around war. Uh, the current revolution in robotic warfare and drones and stuff is often associated with the idea of gaming. Uh, because uh, on a visual level, you see that this is uh, another piece, uh, art, video art piece that kind of just oppose uh, 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 shots from a video game and a real, uh, real footage from, uh, from uh, bombers and drones. Um, so you, you see like on a visual level, like the, thing, the reality is so mediated, it's, it's, be, it's getting very close. Uh, on an experiential level, uh, you, you're using kind of controllers, sometimes controllers for drones are uh, designed to be similar to PlayStation controllers be just because soldiers are already familiar with them. And even on a kind of like on a moral level, like the promise and premise of drone warfare is that you're allowed to fight a war uh, without suffering the consequences. You're kind of like in the safe zone and it's very video game like in a way because in video games you kind of get, you die multiple times and so on. So because of this personal context and uh, the history of the media, I decided to make a game uh, to investigate uh, war in the 21st century, especially uh, unmanned uh, uh, warfare. So this is, this is called Unmanned, you can play it later there. And it's a narrative game about a day in the life of a drone pilot. So one of these guys who lives in Nevada, in uh, like near Las Vegas, and uh, it's sort of imagining the daily routine of these people that are somewhere between uh, uh, front lines and home. They are not quite fighting a war, but they are actually there. So they are sort of telepresent. And the, and the game sort of employs this two channel, two, two gameplay uh, uh, sort of setup uh, that is a, this kind of former solution uh, that uh, it's meant to highlight this, I guess, this disconnection that runs through, through the, the, this experience. So you find yourself essentially multitasking between these two, uh, these two screens and sometimes you have to have in meaningful interaction with your kid after, after work and uh, at the same time play a game within a game. Uh, so this is the scene after you come back and you get to play a, a game and that's a, a way to start a conversation uh, about like the war that it was, uh, like the World War II, for example, and uh, its relationship with the contemporary warfare. And um, another scene is, I guess, the, the main scenes are the ones in which you are actually in this uh, uh, containers in, the, in a military base in Nevada, and you are sort of stalking this suspect, this person of interest, and at the same, at the same time you can uh, have a conversation with your co-pilot and uh, uh, can be a mundane conversation. You sort of decide uh, what kind of topics you want to cover, or you can start kind of flirting with your co-pilot, co and so on. So uh, the idea of the game is that uh, it's not really a game in which uh, uh, you're exploring a space, uh, but uh, like normally you have a guy that moves around. Uh, in this case, the, the structure is pretty linear, pretty narrow, but instead of exploring a, a, a physical space, a virtual space, you're essentially exploring a more um, I guess internal space, uh, so you are, you are essentially contributing to the development of this character. You get to decide uh, how this character uh, kind of like conf is confronted, is reacting to these events. Uh, so it can be like a, a patriotic, uh, jingoistic uh, douchebag, or it can be uh, kind of like a depressed, uh, uh, self-loathing uh, uh, kind of military personnel. And the idea is that uh, like it's not really about creating empathy for drone pilots. The idea is to me the position of a drone operator is kind of close and relatable to the position of a civilian here in the Western world, especially in the United States. In the Western, in, in the United States, we are essentially safe, but we are participating in this war. We can uh, disavow our responsibility 
And uh, so it's important for, for us at least to think uh, like what kind of stories are these people telling themselves and what kind of stories are we telling ourselves. So uh, this example, these examples here uh, I just talked about are essentially taking advantage of role play, which is an important part of games. Like you are, you get to see the world from a different perspective of a fictional character and so on and uh, you are confronted with ethical choices, but I think there is a potential in uh, a very different approach, which is a more like a systemic approach, uh, a procedural rhetoric, I guess, uh, approach. So games are, at their core, they are systems. They are systems of rules that you get to know by interacting with them, by, the, by exploding loopholes, by choosing from a range of possibilities and evaluating the outcomes and so on. So the, my hypothesis is, or several people's hypothesis is, uh, due to the fact that the games are inherently systemic, maybe they can be better suited for representing uh, uh, systemic uh, or like uh, complex and dynamic systems, real world systems. And so that's, uh, that's a bit, a bit the, uh, of an idea that I tried for the first time uh, um, by uh, making a game uh, about McDonald's. To me, the problem with McDonald's is not just that the food is bad or unhealthy. To me, the problem with McDonald's is a bunch of things that I wanted to kind of like put, put together. So there are many arguments against fast food. It's not good for health, but uh, I was more interested in the systemic reasons. For example, the deforestation and the emissions that happen uh, in the process of creating this uh, kind of like cheap uh, uh, burgers. Uh, and uh, the labor aspect, McDonald's kind of introduced, created uh, the model of precarious labor that then was, had been adopted uh, across, the, across every industry now. So uh, essentially, they created a game in which you are um, the CEO of the McDonald's Corporation and you have to manage this process from uh, the pastures to uh, the restaurants, so to the fast food. Uh, dealing with a bunch of different variables and uh, essentially doing, uh, uh, having the chance to uh, uh, take the, also the unethical choices. So you can, uh, uh, and you're sort of forced by your board of directors and by more market forces to uh, maximize your profit by uh, giving hormones to your cows or uh, demolishing a, a native village or corrupting uh, uh, a South American town to get uh, more land for uh, um, for bo for your bovines and so on, and all the way up to uh, public relationships and, uh, and marketing, kind of manipulative marketing. Um, so that's, that's, that was the idea, essentially to uh, put together what the global trans transnational capitalism uh, uh, separates. Um, so another, sim another similar game uh, that I'm not going to explain too much is, is, is called uh, Oligarchy, and this time is, the emphasis is, is also, it is also a management simulator, uh, but the emphasis in this case is on uh, uh, the oil industry, the relationship between, between the oil industry and the politics, especially in the United States. Um, so, um, yeah, so what you do is essentially you are uh, looking for new oil fields, uh, you are developing your, uh, your industry, but then you realize that you kind of hit a wall and then you, you have to start to uh, participate in politics and uh, make sure that you control uh, a decent amount of the parliaments, the, the government, in order to unlock new places. For example, you can finally move to Iraq, or you can uh, start uh, drilling on a national park. And it's all pretty much inspired by actual things that, that really happened. This is a mini game that represents my a view of the American democracy. And uh, you have these two giant robots that you are sort of feeding with a lot of money. Um, anyway, uh, so, and I, I realized that I, I could have made a game for pretty much every industry because every industry has uh, uh, negative externalities and uh, has problems because obviously the problem is not that McDonald's itself uh, or uh, uh, the Shell uh, or, or Monsanto. Uh, it's more like a systemic problem obviously. And uh, I sort of realized that I wasn't immune either, like being a designer, being a game uh, a creator, um, all sort of like this kind of like design immaterial, so called immaterial jobs. Uh, um, we like to probably think that we are a little bit uh, detached from uh, uh, material reality of uh, you know, oil exploration or so on. Uh, but I, 
but beneath this kind of like smooth surface, this smooth informational surface, surface there is a very material reality that I kind of wanted to explore. Um, so uh, I made this game, fun story, that is like down behind you, uh, that kind of explores the dark side of the global economy, especially re in relation to the manufacturing of uh, smartphones and uh, you know electronics. So it's, it's not a simulation, it's, it's kind of like a series of vignettes depicting various phases of the manufacturing process. So the idea was to make a game for iPhone, an app that is about uh, what happens in the creation of this, uh, uh, this object that you are holding in your hand. So uh, as you start, you have uh, uh, this face, is essentially your, your phone takes life as a face and uh, starts to address you and uh, uh, tells you the story of uh, its material from uh, uh, the minerals in Congo, from the mines in Congo, all the way to uh, to uh, the place where all the electronic waste is displaced uh, in uh, terrible conditions. So I'll give you a tag. So it's, it's, it's kind of like straightforward uh, voiceover and you're sort of playing these things and that uh, you sort of like uh, slowly, it, it slowly unpacks what you are actually doing. So you start playing almost mechanically by, you know, uh, these are kind of like simple games. Uh, oh yeah, catch, catch the guy and then it sort of tells you what, uh, what, what, what is really happening and what is this scene and this uh, inspire uh, by. Um, and so, yeah. And uh, ha had a bit of an issue, it, it got censored by, by Apple and so on. <clears throat> uh, but it's still available for Android and uh, in uh, special places like this. Because <laughs> uh, uh, I, I can still install it on uh, 100 uh, uh, devices as long as I know which one are to be installed. Anyway, uh, with these games I don't really just want to promote certain ideas. I just don't want them uh, to use them as media for alternative messages. To me, uh, an even more crucial issue is the issue of game literacy. So games and simulations are not neutral representations. Uh, like between a city and a virtual model of the city, like a Sin City, there is a person or many people sometimes uh, with their own system of values, with their own beliefs, with their own uh, cultural backgrounds, and of course with their own biases. Uh, so this process of creating a model out of an, uh, a real world situation is not, it's, it's a design process, so it's not politically neutral. And uh, I think in a sense every game uh, represents a particular idea of how uh, a city or a farm or an industry or uh, uh, a social relationship uh, function. So, uh, uh, I, will, I, I, I used to say that every game is basically a theory about a system. It's kind of like a theory you can play with. And uh, starting from that uh, sort of uh, idea, I, I kind of created uh, more abstract kind of games that are uh, presented as playable theories. So instead of representing a system that is pretty clear, oh, there is a cow, there is, a, there is an oil rig, uh, it's more about concepts and uh, dynamics and forces, in this case, uh, this is a free culture, free culture game, and uh, uh, it's kind of like a bit of, a, of an ecosystem that represents the tension between uh, uh, free culture, like uh, open source, and uh, uh, free sharing on the internet, for example, and uh, uh, the market forces that are essentially taking advantage of this uh, free information to repackage it, to commodify it, and so on. Um, so it, it's, it's a bit more complicated than how it seems. It seems that you're just avoiding that, but uh, you, you, got, you have to play it to sort of figure that out. Um, or this, this other game that will be here, uh, is exhibited here exactly on this projector uh, in a few minutes. It's called To Build a Better Mousetrap, and it's also a management game, but this time it's more abstract kind of game. So it's kind of a, an intro to Marxism in, in a way. Um, <clears throat> but it's also updated to the contemporary sort of times. So the idea is to make uh, this transparent simulation in which you're essentially seeing in one screen all the flows of resources and uh, all the commodities and stuff and you have to manage uh, uh, kind of like dragging and dropping uh, these workers that are shaped like mice uh, and uh, deciding whether or not you want to invest uh, in uh, uh, either research, pro producing new products or uh, optimizing and uh, uh, kind of creating, uh, uh, automatizing the process, so kind of cutting co costs. 
And uh, obviously, the, uh, the more you're sort of uh, replacing workers with computers and uh, machines, uh, the more you have to manage uh, a dissent. And so this is kind of like about the relationship between uh, innovation. It's not just that simple, plain, linear relationship that oh, uh, ro robots are stealing our jobs, but it's about this essentially uh, conflict, these contracts that, that I think is going to define the next probably in the next 50 years or so. Automation versus uh, robotics versus uh, uh, real live la labor. So yeah, to conclude, I, I just, want, uh, was just want to make it quick. And uh, uh, I was at the NSK show uh, last, the, the other night and uh, uh, there, is a, there is a quote that I really like that I knew from before. And the statement is like, all art is subject to political manipulation except for that which speaks the language of the same manipulation. So uh, to me, that, that kind of like idea or that kind of approach uh, is it's a bit of a guiding uh, uh, a guideline for me. Uh, like all these games are clearly overtly political, they are overtly ideological, uh, because they don't, and they don't pretend to be neutral and uh, they don't pretend to be realistic. There is a lot of uh, uh, discourse about realism in games that doesn't mean that what you, what you think you mean. Um, and uh, they don't pretend to be neutral or realistic because the point is also to show the degree of manipulation that is happening and can happen in like, all games and all interactive systems. So the goal is not just to change uh, the way people see the world using games, but also to change the way people see and experience all games and all simulations. So that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. This is the website. <laughs> You can, you can toss some DVDs. All right.